Hello, everyone. We are so delighted to have you here today. My name is Amy Huang, and I'm the Associate Director of Scientific Ecosystems at the Good Food Institute, and I will be moderating today's session. As you join in, please feel free to send a message in the chat sharing maybe a little bit about yourself and what you're interested in learning more about today. We are always excited to welcome new researchers into the fold of our scientific community. So again, we are delighted that you're here to join us. In just a couple of short moments, you'll learn a lot more from my colleagues on the science and technology team about the Good Food Institute, the scientific case for alternative proteins, research opportunities in this emerging field, of which there are many, and resources we've built to support your work. If you have any questions throughout, please do feel free to drop them in the Q&A section, and we'll make sure to address them after the presentation. And one last item. Um, before we get started, I would love to invite you all to join our Alternative Protein Researcher Directory. GFI's Alt Protein Researcher Directory will allow you to share your work on or related to alternative proteins, publicize the ways that you hope to collaborate with other experts, labs, or companies, and identify potential partners to help you scale up the impact of your work. This is the way that we keep in touch with our scientific ecosystem. Um, so if you want to kind of receive curated updates on new funding opportunities and research developments and collaborators that match your skills and interests, this is the directory to join. Um, so my colleagues have just dropped the link there in the chat. So without further ado, let's dive in. Um, Again, today we're gonna to be chatting about the case for alternative proteins, the science of plant-based meat, cultivated meat and fermentation. We'll dive into funding opportunities and some useful resources for you all and then move into Q&A. Um, so with that, I will pass the baton to my colleague, the Director of Science and Technology, Matt Hotz. Thank you, Amy. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to start with one basic fact. Um, the global man demand for meat will likely double in the next 25 years. The, the estimates vary, but it will very much likely double in the next 25 years. And for me, that raises the question, how much more grain would we need to meet this future global demand for meat? Next slide, please. Let's put this in terms of recent events. Uh, during the Ukraine war that's ongoing, in 2022, Ukraine lost nearly 34 million tons of grain and possible, possible that this set off the current global inflationary pattern that we find ourselves in today. So if you put that in perspective to the amount of meat that we need to, uh, to grow or the amount of grain that we need to grow, we would need to add the equivalent of 3.6 Ukraine wars worth of grain to the food supply every year for the next 25 years to satisfy this meat demand. As a citizen, a scientist, and an environmental engineer, I've realized that this is irresponsible to continue on this path that we were taking. And I will tell you a little, little bit more about why that is in a minute. But first, if you'll please allow me to introduce the Good Food Institute. Thank you, Renee. The Good Food Institute is a nonprofit 501c3 that is dedicated to accelerating the shift to a sustainable, healthy, and just food system. We are funded by philanthropy and have earned GuideStar's Platinum Steel Seal for transparency and honor obtained by less than 1% of nonprofits. Our organization employs over 190 staff across around the globe with three key programmatic departments. Our corporate engagement team built relationships with the world's largest food manufacturers, meat companies, restaurants, and retailers to help them capitalize on opportunities and alternative proteins. We also provide support for industry entrepreneurs and startups, as well as investors and financial institutions. Our policy team advocates for fair regulation of plant-based and cultivated meat and lobbies for government investment in sustainable protein research and development. In science and technology, the group you have here with you today, our team of PhD scientists work to advance and open source the foundational science of alternative proteins, uh, and as a result, create a thriving research ecosystem. 
That's why we are welcoming you to the webinar today. We plan a we play a unique role because we are here to lift up all the stakeholders in the alternative protein space. Next slide, please, Renee. We do this in three main ways. We share insights and data freely and widely. We seek out knowledge gaps, and we love to step back and understand the secondary and tertiary effects of developments in the alternative protein space. Now about that meat demand, we know it's a problem, but how big and multifaceted is that problem with meat? It turns out that this problem is, according to researchers at the Carnegie Endowment for an International Peace, of utmost strategic importance. It's connected back to the three biggest security threats we face, pandemics, climate change, and food security. Let's talk about food security first and then get into pand pandemics and climate change. And this comes back to the point about the 3.6 Ukraine war per year problem. Next slide, please. We have to put one, eight calories of grain into a chicken to have one calorie of chicken come out of that chicken. And in, in fact, chicken is the most efficient of, of animals in terms of converting grain over into meat. Other meats are worse and or much worse in the case of cows. Next slide, please. It's as if we're throwing away 90% or more of all food that we make. That's why we need so much more grain to sustain this growing global de meat demand. And it, in order to achieve these efficiencies, we've had to keep animals in close quarters under conditions that are terrible for their welfare and for ours. Close quartered industrial animal agriculture breeds zoonotic diseases. The UN identifies industrial animal agriculture as the top two possible sources of the next pandemic. On top of this, we are creating antibiotic resistant bacteria by dosing all these animals continuously with antibiotics. There are millions of possible future deaths that will be attributable to antibiotic resistant bacteria from industrial animal agriculture. This is bad enough to justify major action amongst government scientists and engineers globally, but then you throw in climate change on top of all of that and the importance of developing alternative proteins becomes all too clear. Next slide, please. Industrial animal agriculture is responsible for 20% or more of global greenhouse gas emissions and the switch to alternative proteins would be a huge step to mitigate these impacts. GFI has a theory of change to accomplish this. Next slide, please. Culture is much more difficult to change than science and technology. So we work to improve taste, texture, price, and sustainability of protein sources. And there are three technology platforms that we focus on. Next slide, please. And we are lucky to have our three of our subject matter experts here today to introduce you to the key research questions in each of these areas. There are ripe needs across the board that we think all of you will be excited about participating in. Next slide, please. And for now, I will hand off to Dr. Pri Panasso, our plant-based expert, to take us from here. Excellent. Thank you for that very motivational um, introduction, Matt. I'm really excited to talk about plant-based meat in particular and plant-based foods kind of more generally. Um, there's a lot of opportunities across the entire value chain, all the way from growing the seed to what ends up landing on our plates in the plant-based food value chain. Um, and in particular, we're really looking at these products that can truly mimic the meat, milk, cheeses that we're seeing in the markets today, but offer those environmental benefits that Matt just discussed. So starting with crop development, there is a lot of opportunity for different source selections, looking at novel protein sources and really deciding how well that they can do in plant-based meat products and plant-based food products. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of these in depth in a second, um, give some examples. But in addition to looking at novel sources, what about breeding some of the sources that we look into to further optimize them, uh, making them so that there's higher protein content, the protein is more digestible, it's mimicking animal protein a little bit more. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities for breeders there. 
In addition, there's a lot of opportunities in ingredient optimization, whether that be chemical extraction, bioprocessing, uh, mechanical processing. There are a lot of really innovative ways to get ingredients like proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, fibers out of these plant sources or even some, uh, some uh, aquatic sources like seaweed or duckweed. And then finally, on the end part of the value chain, there's opportunities for protein texturization, in particular for plant-based meat, um, looking at, okay, how do we actually make these fibers? Um, how do we actually make a material out of plant proteins that really looks appealing, tastes appealing, um, <laughs> and it has that nice fibrous texture that we see in meat? And then finally, um, formulation. How do we actually put all those components together? So looking at the beginning part of the value chain, um, we see that a lot of companies are using soy and wheat, and some of them are using pea. So really, we're focused on just three crops um, in the plant-based market right now, um, looking at you know high protein content. But there's a lot of other crops out there. We know that these ones have just been utilized because they have the um, best supply chains right now. So they're really the most affordable and they've been the most tested as far as functionality goes. But there's a lot of room for optimization there, whether that be looking into a new source or breeding these ones to be even better. Next slide, please. Um, so one example of this is a GFI gram T. Um, I accidentally... Um, I uh, didn't put uh, the, their new name under Dr. Stiles' name, but um, it's Amaro Foods, and they make a delicious plant-based bacon out of red seaweeds. And so um, their work really focused on looking at a bunch of different red seaweeds, evaluating their different costs, um, the proteins that are available in them, looking at how to actually extract out those proteins in a meaningful way. And um, they have just done a really wonderful job and um, are starting to uh, produce that as a product. And um, just to look even further here, um, looking at red seaweed proved to be incredibly important. If we look at the pink um, bars here, those are all different types of red seaweed that Umaro evaluated. And then if we look at the green, the light green, and the gray, those are soy pea and rice, uh, brown rice protein, which are a little bit more traditionally used. We see that red seaweed really has a lot more amino acids per 100 grams of protein. It's a better digestibility, so it could be an even better, healthier choice for folks. And I really implore you to look at our plant protein primer, which has more than two dozen plant protein sources that are novel and could be explored in this field. Um, so that might be a really good source of inspiration for some folks on this call. I also want to point to some really, really novel sources of using side streams. So looking at big, big productions like um, beer production, and then taking the spent grain from that and seeing if that can be used in plant protein production. So we have another GFI grantee, Dr. Sato, who has been looking at brewer's spent grain and looking at different extraction techniques and evaluating the different functionalities that come out of the brewer's spent grain protein as a result. And here she evaluated um, water holding capacity, oil absorption capacity, uh, hydrophobicity, as well as emulsification stability. And then finally, on the end part of the value chain, really a big part of this is persuading these globular spherical proteins to act like the fibrous proteins that we see in animals. Um, how can we get that really nice um, fiber texture from, uh, from muscle tissue with plant proteins? And um, it really depends on what you're looking at. There's a wide variety of different types of meat products, whether that be restructured, so more like sausages and, and beef patties. Um, those are the ones that are really commercially available right now and a little bit easier to make um, just because they don't look like the original animal structure, um, all the way to whole muscle, which is really just a, a cut of a muscle. So like sashimi or a steak. Um, something that really, really looks like it's straight from the animal and has that um, nice fibrous texture. So there's a variety of different ways that people have been doing this. The existing methods are mostly extrusion, which is used in other um, industries as well, like uh, pasta, dry snacks, cereals, et cetera. Um, but there's a lot of room for innovation and people have been innovating not only on extruders, but looking at different types of texturization as well. So different types of spinning, electro spinning, wet spinning, um, those would be amazing because we'd be able to do a bottom up building of these fibrous structures and really get them into a granular scale, scale that 
that really mimics meat texture. Um, 3D printing as well, fermentation can be used for texturization as well. And there's a lot of other really unique techniques. I'll talk about one in a second. So another one of our GFI grantees, Henry Yu, he does this really original process where he prints 2D, or not prints, he makes these 2D protein sheets and then does a micro imprintation onto the 2D uh, sheets um, through a roll-to-roll -roll system. So this is borrowing from other industries that use this type of 2D non-woven um, type system. And then they're able to stack the 2D sheets onto each other to really form something that looks like a muscle fiber cut. Next slide, please. So if we look a little bit more, the, the blue circle here is just texturized vegetable protein. The pink one is in-house soy. And then the green one on the right is chicken breast. And we can see that with their novel strategy, they're able to um, make something that looks really, really similar to chicken breast whole cut. And with that, I would love to pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Elliot Swartz. Thank you, Pri, for that overview. Um, so my name is Elliot. I'm one of the scientists here working on cultivated meat. And so I wanted to first explain the cultivated meat production process for those that might be less familiar. So at a high level, uh, the cultivated meat production process begins by taking a small sample of cells, typically from a living animal, but in some cases a recently slaughtered animal. And those cells can be brought back to the lab where they're selected and sorted for cell types of interest that can uh, be used for sort of biomanufacturing scale up and also suitable for use in food to create meat products. So at a high level, you know, the prod production process happens in two phases where the first phase is really focused on creating as many cells as possible. We use uh, equipment called bioreactors to do that and cells are grown in a cell culture media that contains the nutrients and growth factors that cells need to proliferate. And the second phase is about differentiating those cells into the principal components of meat, so primarily muscle, fat, and sometimes connective tissue. Um, manufacturers might use a different bioreactor type or environmental condition in the presence of scaffolding structures um, that could provide the structure for these cells to adhere to to create a fuller range of products. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So some of these product prototypes are shown here on the right. And as you can imagine from the sort of range of, of disciplines here, we really need a lot of uh, cell and molecular biologists, biochemists, uh, bioprocess and chemical engineers, as well as tissue engineers um, to, to solve this and finally involving sort of food scientists um, as well to create the final products. So next slide. So I, I think um, with cultivated meat, I just wanted to talk mostly about, you know, what are the biggest challenges that need to be solved and you know, give you some sense of what can be done to address those. And for cultivated meat in particular, it really comes down to cost and scale. And so this graph here is from a techno-economic assessment of cultivated meat that was published a few years ago. Um, and essentially what it shows is that, you know, if you're making cultivated meat today, the, the growth media that I described before is really the current cost driver. But as I'll show in a few slides, we think this is tractable to reduce those costs. And so in the longer term, we think that infrastructure, so new buildings, as well as the bioreactor equipment that's used and overall process efficiencies are going to be uh, the major cost drivers of this industry. And so I'll talk a little bit more about these um, in the, the next slides. So for media in particular, there's really two um, steps that need to happen. The first step is simply using lower cost ingredients. And then the next step is using less of those ingredients overall. So back in 2019, my colleague Liz aimed to get a sense of, you know, how low of a cost reduction can we have for cell culture media? Um, and she did an analysis of various different scenarios that showed that you can basically take what's used in the pharmaceutical industry today at price points around $400 per liter and get that to around 25 cents per liter through the actions that I uh, have bullet pointed here above in yellow. So essentially the steps involved here are switching from pharma grade sourcing material into food or feed grade materials, um, using fewer or simply replacing expensive recombinant proteins and growth factors that are included in the media and also switching how we source some of these ingredients. So today, amino acids are 
primarily sourced through precision fermentation processes. Um, but we think in the future, this might switch predominantly to things like hydrolysates and extracts from plants or algae. And then finally, scaling up this food grade supply chain um, can capitalize on some economies of scale with these new inputs. And you can see the graph on the, the right there. So if you go back uh, just briefly, that companies in the industry have anecdotally reduced their costs of, of cell culture media by about 99% or more. And we think that there will be publications in the peer reviewed literature pretty soon that uh, sort of validate this overall model. Next slide. So the second step is really about using less media. So thinking about media, uh, not on a dollar per liter basis, but on a grams per kilogram of cultivated meat basis. So this table on the left here shows different studies and tries to estimate how many amino acids or the quantity of amino acids and sugars that are going to be needed to create a given quantity or one kilogram of cultivated meat, given some uh, assumptions around its dry matter content and protein content. And these models are still sort of rough around the edges. They're based on sort of hypothetical metabolisms. And so we think that this is gonna be a longer challenge to optimize for the industry, but will include things like the creation of metabolic models that will help manufacturers match the cell culture media formulation to that cell metabolism and ultimately lower that feed conversion ratio that uh, Matt talked about at the beginning. We also need um, metabolic and cell line engineers to think about how to uh, solve challenges related to ammonia production that can be toxic to cells, as seen in the, the patent here on this slide. Um, some companies are already pursuing this, as well as how to maximize biomass accumulation. There's also opportunities and work going on to uh, recycle some of the media components and valorize potential co-products like lactate that can be produced in high quantities. And then finally, all of these actions are really important for uh, environmental sustainability long term. Next slide. So switching gears on the infrastructure side of things, I just wanted to sort of give people a sense of the scale of the challenge here with infrastructure. So a report by McKinsey in 2021 estimated that to produce around 1.5 million metric tons of cultivated meat, which would be equivalent to about 0.4% of the entire global meat market in 2030, you would need about 22 times of the current global pharmaceutical industry's volumetric capacity. And as you can see by the quote on the top that, you know, this kind of infrastructure just doesn't exist right now on the planet. And so we're going to need to build it by putting steel in the ground. So next slide. Some of the ways that we can sort of limit the overall capital expenditure of this industry as it scales up uh, include, you know, thinking about how to maximize process efficiency so that we need fewer uh, overall facilities, less bioreactor equipment in those facilities to produce the same given quantity of meat. And so we think that, you know, this is going to require a lot of different forms of engineering, but I think what's important here, are the creation of uh, robust techno-economic models that can guide process design and scale up. There's still a lot of decision points that can be made in this industry, and it's still a lot of, I think, open questions on what is the best path forward. We need folks that are skilled in uh, computational modeling and software engineering that can bring some of these expensive experiments into the computer. And we also need to think about building this industry for food, not pharma. So that enables us to look at lower cost materials that we might build bioreactors out of, um, equipment with fewer specifications, and thinking about how to really maintain sterility um, in an environment that is for food production rather than pharma. And then finally, things like automation, design of sensors, uh, you know, electrical engineers and mechanical engineers thinking about how to really create the most efficient production system that allows us to have, um, you know, eyes on what's happening at all times will be really crucial. And then finally, on the last slide, I know there's probably a lot of bioengineers, or tissue engineers that are, are interested in this field. And so I just wanted to briefly talk about scaffolding that I mentioned before. Um, a lot of these techniques come from the regenerative medicine field, but unlike medicine, there's really less functionality that is required for scaffolding for cultivated meat. But on the other hand, we want to think about what are the materials that we can use for cultivated meat production, specifically materials that are edible or biodegradable, that are low cost, um, that can uh, have the thermostability required for um, holding up when cooking, for instance. Um, so some of these materials that are being pursued or looked at in the industry are shown in this table on the left. So things like alginate or chitosin, 
more complex uh, composites like decellularized tissues from plants or soy hydrolysates um, have also been used. So materials is one sort of aspect. Uh, and then the other is um, what is the method of, of biofabrication? So shown here is a, you know, an overview of just some of the methods that companies and other researchers are employing from bioprinting to hydrogels to polymer spinning, like electro spinning or immersion rotary jet spinning, which is shown here. Um, again, these are sort of applicable as pre-mentioned across, you know, plant, plant-based meats as well as um, cultivated meat um, it, to really create structures that are going to be uh, going to replicate these uh, whole muscle cuts for meat that are often more difficult to create. So hopefully that gives you some sense of the, the challenges and opportunities in the field. And I'll pass it to Adam, who will just talk about fermentation. Thanks, Elliot. Um, thanks for you all being here today. Uh, Renee, you can move to the next slide. Great. So here at GFI, we take um, a relatively wide view of fermentation. So really fermentation is an enabling technology that allows us to produce proteins in a lot of different ways using microbes such as filamentous fungi, bacteria, yeast, or microalgaes, and either programming them to express specific proteins that may come from elsewhere in the animal or plant world, or harvesting that whole biomass. Next slide, please. Yeah. So Traditional fermentation is, is usually what we think about when we think about food fermentation. And you can think of a variety of different products that have come from across cultures around the world, things like sauerkrauts or tempeh or kimchi, where, where a plant-based substrate is, is taken and then a, a microbial um, inoculation happens, either naturally or intentionally. And then that microbe helps to upvalue the nutrition, shelf life, or taste of, of a plant-based product. And we do see innovations in this space now, but some of the really exciting things that have happened that have really pushed the technology forward are innovations in biomass fermentation and precision fermentation. So in biomass fermentation, the subtle difference from traditional fermentation is taking a substrate and driving that substrate almost completely to producing a, a whole biomass protein. So taking a microbe that's going to consume as much of that substrate as possible, convert it into a protein product that gets lightly processed, so maybe heat inactivated, and then almost all of that tissue is then used uh, to, to create a, a, a protein product. In precision fermentation, we're taking um, either an intentionally engineered uh, microorganism that may make a protein or have a pathway that's engineered that, that has a, a fatty acid or lipid at the end of the pathway, or an, an ingredient like a pigment or other functional ingredient, and then having it make as much of that ingredient as possible, and then using a, a downstream uh, purification process that removes that ingredient away from the biomass of the fermentation, and then allows that ingredient to go on and be part of, of our food system. So in biomass, we can take things like mycelium or filamentous fungi and make whole whole cut protein. And you can see images on the top here of things like, like uh, fungal steaks or bacons, where that, that long fibrous and filamentous structure of the, the fungi are taken advantage of to make something that mimics the taste and texture of, of uh, animal derived meat. There are other ways to take wholesale biomass where you can take from bacteria or fungi and then use a dry spray powder or something like that to get uh, a protein powder that can then be added to other products. And we're even seeing the use of things like gas fermentation where uh, microorganisms that can fix methane or carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide from the atmosphere within a, a fermenter, pull those into to, uh, carbon structures and then, and then into amino acids to make protein just from gas as a feedstock. So those are really exciting. And that's places like solar foods that air protein. Okay, next slide. So precision fermentation, we've seen kind of an explosion of companies uh, that have come around in the past few years that are taking and making a specific ingredient using a variety of fermentation uh, approaches. So companies like Every are making egg white proteins, which are an important texturizer and binder in the food industry. Milk proteins um, like whey that can go into things like ice cream are being produced commercially. And a huge push right now in the industry is to make proteins like casein that can replicate that bite and stretch that you get from uh, animal-derived milk proteins to go into things like cheeses. Collagen proteins are an important structural part of a lot of foods and are an important ingredient that can be made by fermentation in bacteria or in fungi. And then heme proteins. So heme is a molecule that binds to iron. And if you can uh, deliver iron to a lot of foods, you can enhance the flavor, the smell, and, and sort of the, the other appealing properties of that food. 
And so Impossible uses yeast to make a heme binding protein and Triton Algae Innovations uses a microalgae to do so. And then to circle back to, to cultivated meat, uh, there are companies that are using uh, fermentation now to make growth factors. There are small peptides and signaling molecules that allow for, for effective growth of cultivated meat tissues within the bioreactor. So I'm talking about fermentation from a, a more commercial way, just to describe sort of the absolute breadth of different things that are able to be made by, by microbes. And why do we make a lot of these things by microbes? Well, it's because uh, industrial fermentation as it stands now is quite a mature and proven industry. So fermentation can occur at scales of 600,000 liters or even above, especially in the case of things like biofuels. It can be made at a relatively low cost. We're making things again like fuels, feed ingredients, bioplastics, and other high volume, low cost products using microbial uh, fermentation processes. And many of the microbes that we're using today in, in, in fermentation are already familiar to the food world. So these are, are uh, demonstrated safe uh, microbes that uh, regulators have approved of in the past. And uh, we're seeing some new ones too that are going through that, that regulatory process now. One of the true advantages of microbes is the, the fast growth of microbes as compared to plants or animal cells. So in a microbial fermentation system, you could have a really fast R&D cycle to try and figure out how to optimize the bioprocess. But then also when it comes to production, many of these uh, processes happen quite quickly. Next slide, please. And there's some real world examples of this where industrial biotechnology to, to produce a product has gone from uh, basically being invented to completely taking over the market in just a few years. So if you could think back to the 1920s and the, the bio industry as it was then, um, citric acid produced by, by bacteria has almost completely took over the entire industry within a decade because it was able to be made more effectively, more cleanly, and cheaper than plant-derived uh, citric acid purification. And the same thing happened with, with yeast-derived uh, insulin. When we're able to make insulin uh, using yeast, we can make it more pure and, and cheaper and um, more available than it was from the animal-derived counterparts. And then finally, a great example in food, in 1990, the FDA um, approved the use of recombinant rennet enzymes, so the enzymes used in cheese making. And once we could make and had an approved process for making rennet, uh, an, uh, animal rennet was almost completely displaced by, by uh, precision fermentation drive rennet. Next slide. So what are our research needs and wants in the fermentation industry? Well, much of that is driven by, by what you see in the number one here. That's the target selection and end product formulation. The, the desire for particular ingredients that could be made by fermentation are really driving this industry. And that's why you're seeing things like uh, formerly animal-derived proteins, like dairy proteins or egg proteins that are now a focus of the industry. And really that goes back to how we do our, our biological design and, and try to do things like increase our, our strain development capabilities, our bioprocess engineering, and then our feedstock and, and medium optimization. So we can go to the next one. Yeah, so in strain development, we have two real major goals in all different kinds of fermentation, and I'm generalizing out um, because there are lots of different organisms, but essentially we could improve productivity on the upstream side for nearly every single organism that's used in fermentation. In biomass organisms, Hopefully we can either tweak the environment, the conditions, or the, the genetics of that organism to produce a, a higher amount of biomass, or if we're producing a precision fermentation product, to produce more product in a shorter amount of time. And then the second is to develop more robust organisms, organisms that don't need as much temperature control, pressure control, or can tolerate more shear stress in larger and larger bioreactors as the industry scales to, to really commoditize large fermenters. Now, much like what Pre was talking about with, uh, with feedstock valorization, we have the opportunity potentially with our microbes in fermentation to take some of these byproducts from, from other ag streams and be able to uh, engineer or, or bioprospect organisms that can use a variety of, of side stream starches or protein sources to be able to grow on and then drive the cost of fermentation down. So right now, many of these fermentation processes use highly purified uh, corn-derived dextrose or, or other glucose streams, and this really drives a lot of the operating costs in fermentation. And then finally, something I haven't really touched on, but is highly parallel to what Elliot said, is that a lot of these downstream processing capabilities that have been developed for fermentation, where we're doing bioseparation of proteins or fatty acids or even ingredients away from biomass, 
or or to um, purify the biomass are really technologies that are borrowed from biopharma. And in biopharma, typically the, the volumes are smaller and the, the purification requirements are higher. There's a need to have bespoke approaches and downstream processing for the fermentation industry. So to look at new potential strains and microbes for fermentation, we could look at what has happened in, in, in genomics and genetics in the past few years. It's easier and cheaper now than it ever was to go and sequence an entire species, compare that, that species genome, and try to find either functional proteins within that or, or something that may be a food-safe microorganism. And then now we have great tools like CRISPR-Cas9 to go in and edit these to optimize these further for, for foods or for ingredient production. Next slide. And something I'm really excited about is thinking about how we could take and, and evaluate the entire microbial world and try to find new functional proteins for food. Uh, there are new tools like AlphaFold2 that have come out where we can essentially uh, examine the, the protein structure of almost any protein by sequence and try to understand whether it may have functional properties that will fit well within our food system, make good ingredients, and potentially uh, drive a lot of the costs and, and some of the, the precision fermentation uh, intricacies away and make this a little bit more of a simple process. All right, thanks. I'll hand it back over to Matt so he can talk to us about funding opportunities and APs. Thank you, Adam. We've taken the opportunity to highlight three resources here to help you jump right in with your resources, with your research. And we'd encourage you to go right away after this webinar and check these out. Uh, first, we make our best effort to track all ongoing alternative pro protein research globally. And that, there's a there's a tracker on that page currently that we'll share a link for. for and then we also have a forthcoming research dashboard. Uh, both of those places will be great to start to map the landscape as you're trying to enter this alternative protein research space. Next, please. Second, our research grant program is coming very, very soon. Uh, we are anticipating releasing the RFP in July. I can almost taste it. Uh, we will let you know about more details as soon as we are able to, but uh, we are on the cusp of releasing that RFP. Next slide, please. And then the third resource we're highlighting here in terms of research funding is that we also try to track broader funding opportunities in the alternative, re, uh, alternative protein space. Um, and I'd, again, once again, encourage you all to, after this webinar, go in and, and dive into some of those resources for interesting funding opportunities and maybe some deadlines you could try to target as you're writing proposals um, in this space. And with that, I'll hand off to Dr. Marcelo Espiras to take us into some additional GFI resources. Thank you, Matt. Um, so in the last three slides, I'd like to introduce you to the free and open access resources that GFI has to offer to help researchers. So we invite you to join the Alternative Protein Researcher Directory, as you can see here, which is really the value proposition that GFI provides for researchers to network with each other by serving as a central communication hub for alt protein research collaborations. So check out the link that you can see here, gfi.org forward slash researchers. Um, so sign up so you can see and share your research profile interests, publicize ways you hope to collaborate with other experts, labs or companies. And likewise, what you'll also find are researchers who have provided their own research profile and indicated the kind of collaborations that they are seeking. So this could be anything for part, um, from partnerships with other academics, industries, sharing lab equipment, perhaps even mentoring junior scientists, and even listing hiring opportunities in their labs. So this will help you identify potential research partners that will help you scale up the impact of your work, especially if you're own background and theirs, as well as the field of research and interest is a natural fit. Members will also receive a bi-monthly newsletter showcasing research developments, funding opportunities, scientific events and forums, and collaborators that match your skills and interests. And by the way, the link that provided in the previous slide will also be in the chat box, so you can find it there. Now, we have many other resources as well, 
we invite you to explore key research opportunities by checking out the link here, gfi.org forward slash solutions. Since research is all about finding solutions to critical scientific questions, please feel free to browse the alternative protein solutions database, where you can find specific bottlenecks in the three research pillars that are hot topic areas. Now, it's perfectly possible that one of these areas fits nicely with your own research background, your expertise, and your interest, and therefore would be highly worth exploring. Again, this link will be in the chat box. Finally, there are so many other valuable resources we have to showcase for you. So please dive into our many open access resources for researchers. For example, as you can see here in the lower left, we have the Alternative Protein Literature Library, which will help you keep track of literature relevant to alternative proteins in a way that's user-friendly, that allows for advanced filtering, and really saves you time by helping you find the mo most relevant or pinpointed literature quickly and efficiently. Or if you just want to learn more about the foundational science of alternative proteins, you can check out the site here, gfi.org forward slash science, to deep dive into the science behind the three research pillars that our subject matter experts just showcased for you today. So to summarize, this is just a sampling of the many open access resources and databases that GFI offers to help inspire research like yourself as you start your journey to the exciting world of protein research and discovery. Again, please don't forget though to join the Alternative Protein Research Directory after this webinar. The links will be in the chat box once again. And uh, with that, thank you for your time, your effort and your attendance. I know you were all calling from different time zones. And on that note, I'll pass it back to Amy. Thank you so much, Marcelo, and to all of our other speakers. Um, that was really fantastic. I'd love to invite all of the speakers to join us back on camera for the Q&A portion of today's seminar. Um, and I will stop sharing my screen at this time to invite any of the participants of today's webinar to ask the questions that they might have for us. I'll ask one question to maybe get us started here. Um, I am really curious to hear from, um, from our scientists and anyone can kind of dive in here pre Elliot Adam. Um, when it comes to the biggest scientific misconceptions about each of these production pillars, what would you say rises to the top? I'm seeing some head nodding from Pri, so maybe she can dive in here for us. Yeah, well, there's definitely a few that come to mind. I think one of them is just the idea that like processing is bad overall when a lot of the plant-based value chain does involve things that are considered processing. Um, when doing crop fractionation, so making uh, optimizing ingredients or doing extrusion, texturizing protein, those are all processing steps, but they really actually improve the nutrition of the proteins. They make them more digestible by kind of unraveling their, their globular structures, um, and maybe even, um, uh, destroying some of the anti-nutrients that would otherwise, uh, make them harder to digest. Um, there are definitely things that we can, you know, work on as um, <laughs> in within nutrition and health within the value chain. But that's one that's like definitely a misconception. But I think maybe more so for um, for folks just like outside of the food science space in general. Thanks, Pri. Elliot. I, I mean, I think for me, an anecdote is, you know, I I went um, and presented uh, posters on cultivated meat at the. Um, a big stem cell conference back like four years ago. And you'd be surprised at how many people just came up to me and said, this is never going to work. This is, you know, this is crazy idea, et cetera. Um, and I think a lot of people just look at the the challenge and, and think that, you know, there's no way that we can solve this when, you know, you think about the costs, you know, people are familiar with doing cell culture in their tissue hoods. They they think about how, you know, these hundred dollar bottles of media, you know, how are we ever going to grow actual, you know, tissue for food here, but I, I don't think they've actually stopped and considered, um, what media is actually made of and, and where you can source those ingredients and really pick apart the, the problems piece by piece and, and make progress toward that. And I think, you know, people 
don't understand how quickly things have developed just within a short time frame where you know this basically came out you know this industry was born just a couple of years ago and there's already products on the market and there will be more coming shortly so um i i think it's just a invitation to think more creatively uh, about what's possible with um the existing scientific skills that you have love that thanks elliot adam yeah, I'll make mine brief because I see there's a, a new flurry of questions here. Uh, but I think one of the the really uh, important things to keep in mind with fermentation is that once you have a microorganism that produces something, that, that's not where the journey ends for that protein or fat or ingredient. We need to think really holistically about bioprocess and about marrying the what we do in the upstream when we actually ferment to how we we purify out the the ingredients and the the foodstuffs that we're trying to make so i think having that whole bio process upstream and downstream thought of holistically is going to be really important it's going to drive costs down thank you all so much for those reflections um there's a question here about approaching what can feel like a very daunting emerging field and, and trying to find an entry way into this field um, one of our attendees asks, what advice would you have for a scientist with no direct background in alternative protein research, um, but who's really eager to contribute to this entire new scientific undertaking? Oh, well, I'd say you do have uh, the background in alternative protein research. You just don't really know it. I mean, obviously, this wasn't like a field that existed. So no one like is coming. I mean, there are degree programs starting now, um, but, you know, no one has a degree in cultivated meat, really. Um, but there's a lot of, uh, as we discussed, sort of, um, you know, intersecting disciplines. And so I think um, you leverage your skills, but you also quickly pick up on uh, other ones here. I, I found that entering the you know since starting gfi at five years ago i had no idea about food systems i was more of a stem cell biologist but i've quickly picked up you know engineering concepts um you know food science concepts regulatory environmental impact i mean it's sort of more of a holistic approach that enables you to think more about um, different scientific disciplines um, than what you might be limited to currently in your lab Thanks, Elliot. Anyone else want to chime in here? If not, I will move on to our next question. Awesome. So I think the key takeaway there is you do have alt protein experience um, because this is such a deeply interdisciplinary field um, and many opportunities in our resources for you to explore direct applications for those skills. Um, there's a question here about um, regulatory um, environments. So um, one of our attendees asks whether GFI is participating in this push to modernize novel food regulations so that synthetic biology innovations can really move forward. I, I can say that um, this is really where the power of GFI and all of our affiliates uh, come into play. So we have affiliates from across the world who work within particular geopolitical um, atmospheres and government frameworks to really understand what the pressures are and what the local regulations. Obviously, there are some very alternative protein um, sort of advocate governments who are who are more than willing to to move things through and, and fast track it, but still make sure it's safe. So we're thinking about places where there are already uh, approvals for things like cultivated meat. But in 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 regulatory environments like like Europe, where we uh, we have to move a little bit more slowly and understand what's happening, GFI and, and some of our affiliates are are participating in some of the conversations with with frameworks like EFSA to try and make sure that they understand what all of the technologies are, what the safety limits are and things like that, and, and how the government works within those to make sure that everything's safe. And I think what we have is, is a collective industry that wants to make sure that everything that is put out is a safe food product, because that's going to be the thing that really lifts all ships here. Thank you, Adam. Alrighty, there's a question here from a professor at Texas a and I think this question is best suited for pre. Um, is there general interest in improving plant sources of protein with different flavors, et cetera, in combination with sustainable ag production? Their work specifically is focused on drought and heat tolerant warm season lagoons for use as a pulse crop. So maybe you can speak to the uh, research synergies at that intersection. Yeah, I love this question. This is something that I think about a lot. And I think that this is what we need to be going towards. Um, and 
there's a lot of opportunities for this and some movement in the space right now towards this, but in the end, um, in order for us to solve our food and agriculture problems, there isn't really a silver bullet, right? Alternative proteins aren't a silver bullet. Um, biodiversity isn't a silver bullet. Um, like we can't just pick one thing. We really need to be focusing on a myriad of things. Um, additionally, looking at crops, if we're focused on breeding for disease and yield, um, and that's usually what we're focused on in, in commercial production right now, in commercial breeding, as well as um, your academic research, which sounds great. And we need that in conjunction with those increased protein contents and better functionality. Um, you know, farmers aren't going to grow a crop that isn't going to survive a disease, isn't going to survive a drought, isn't going to um, produce high yield, right? And, and consistently, um, they need all of those things in order to keep their, their farms afloat. And so we need that plus um, these added benefits of producing proteins that are even better for human consumption. Um, so there's definitely a lot of really good intersection there, and I could talk forever about it, but I'll stop right there and please reach out if, if you ever want to discuss a little bit more. Thanks so much, Pri. Um, there's another question here about um, the secondary and tertiary consequences or implications of alternative protein production, um, which was mentioned earlier on in the webinar. Um, and they're asking, just inviting somebody to speak a little bit more about what specific consequences or implications kind of come to mind and what GFI is doing to address these implications. Um, and I think this is a good kind of umbrella framing for a lot of the questions that are coming through right now in relation to consumer shifts to alternative protein products, um, some of the recent uh, market performance of, of, uh, of the plant-based products that are um, available to consumers already, um, questions around um, just uh, thinking and framing about health and nutrition, um, and then also um, questions around kind of the welfare and economy of developing and emerging economies in relation to alternative proteins. So lots there, but all kind of in yeah. this um, umbrella of secondary and tertiary consequences and curious. Yeah, Matt, if you want to chime in here first. I think this builds up a, a little on the answer that Adam gave, uh, having a global team, having these three action arms, policy, science and technology, corporate engagement, allows us to come together and think about, for example, road mapping out to 2030 and thinking about, okay, well, if we remove this bottleneck, what's the next bottleneck that's going to come from removing that first bottleneck? And so on and so forth, so that we can plan as GFI, plan appropriately and resource appropriately and tell people, you should be working over here, you should be working over here in anticipation of some of those bottlenecks appearing in the future. So that's uh, just one example of, you know, secondary tertiary thinking. Thanks, Matt. Um, Elliot? Just one other example there, I think, is like land use, global land use, and, and thinking about changes. Um, there are obviously animal agriculture uses a lot of, of our global uh, land, arable land, uh, to raise animals or grow crops for animals. And so thinking about with a growing market share of alternative proteins, how that land could be used better or the carbon opportunity cost of those land is, is really important. And we have some ongoing analyses in the United States and the UK that are looking at that. So that's just one example. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, there is a question here. Um, I know it was briefly addressed by Elliot, but we've gotten a signal boost for this question about the recent LCA from UC Davis. Um, wondering if you can provide some um, some commentary on, on that LCA and, and maybe some future um, things that you have on the radar. Sure. So, I mean, this is a, it's about a pair of studies that was recently published about the environmental impact of cultivated meat. Um, I think there are some issues with that study, specifically with respect to some of their assumptions around endotoxins and, and pharma grade um, materials in the in the field. And so I've been talking to a lot of media input suppliers to gather sort of information on um, these assumptions that we suspect are wrong and that I think I've confirmed are, are incorrect. And I'll be 
just putting that together um, and sharing that with the authors and, you know, they can take that and do with that information with what they will. Um, but I'll also be posting that uh, sort of public peer review critique, hopefully on my own social feeds um, so people can take a closer look at um, understanding the nuances there. Awesome. Thanks so much, Elliot. Um, if anyone feels able to kind of dig up um, the LCA TEAs that, um, that we have published, um, that might be a useful resource for some folks here in the audience. Um, there's a question here around how we divide up the new foods ontology. Um, so this attendee is wondering, where do you put cell-free processing? And do you think it's a big factor in foods versus commodity chemicals? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. And I think this is one of the places where um, we really have seen integrated bioprocess that's happened for commodity chemicals and things like that. So if you look at bioethanol and biofuels, we have large scale treatment of, of corn with amylases, and we're able to treat that in a cell-free way to, to process out those starches and get sugars. So I'm, I'm expecting that probably at least on the food side, we'll see these kind of hybrid approaches where there will be something like plants growing up uh, protein and then some bioprocessing that exists in a cell-free way with, with enzymes or, or something else, or a fermentation product that's improved in some way by an enzyme treatment in a cell-free way. Uh, by and large, I don't know if I see uh, a really complicated bioprocess that happens all in, in a sort of in vitro biology, but it would be exciting if someone could demonstrate that at scale. Thank you so much, Adam. Thank you so much to everybody for coming out from your various corners of the world to join us today. Again, it's it's one of the truest delights to see this scientific community growing in size, scale, diversity, interconnectedness. We're just so excited um, to have you all um, engaging meaningfully with this space. Um, if you haven't already, please be sure to join our Alternative Protein Researcher Directory so that we can keep you up to date. You, you'll be the first to know when our RF P goes live and when there are other key funding opportunities and research updates to keep um, you all in the loop. Um, and if you have any specific questions, feel free to reach out directly. We would love to help you um, support your journey through the alternative protein scientific ecosystem. Um, and again, thank you all for being here. And thank you to all of our speakers for contributing their insights. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day and um, hope to engage with you again soon. Thanks, everybody.